Hmm. We're live. Are we? We are. Good evening, <laughs> wrestling fans. Doug doesn't know that he's live, but he is now live on the internet. Doug, you do a show on Sunday night. Surprise. I, I do, but it's, you know, it's just, I hit go live and it's just still spinning over here in the corner for me. So I guess That's, we're live. <laughs> yeah, it, it says live in the corner, been live for 24 seconds. Huh. Yeah, it, it it's, is. It, I'm not live over here. <laughs> Well, apparently Doug isn't live, but uh, I am live. Doug is pre-taped, and which makes this conversation, folks, even more impressive that we're having, uh, considering that Doug had filmed uh, his portion of this earlier. So we hope you're impressed uh, with the Tudor Bros Wrestling Show this evening, uh, because tonight is a good night to be here. Um, Doug, the main event topic tonight is uh, something that's near and dear to your heart. I love me a good stable or a good faction. I've always been confused what the difference is between a stable and a faction, so maybe we can talk about that a little bit tonight. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk everything factions in pro wrestling because, folks, uh, if you're not watching AEW, maybe you don't know this, but factions are back in a big way, and we're going to talk a, a little bit about why that is in our main event segment tonight. But uh, before we get to that... Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. There we go. Opening bell. <laughs> We got some news, folks, in the opening bell. Um, Doug, it's not been a month the, since we've had uh, unopposed nights of wrestling broadcasting, but um, now there is speculation that we might need to be preparing for some more shuffling around of wrestling TV shows. It's being yep. reported that AEW Dynamite may be forced to move off of Wednesday nights uh, in the not-so-distant future. Last week, this past week, rather, it was announced Turner Sports had acquired the rights to uh, NHL broadcast. And Wednesdays are a big night for professional hockey. So the amount of money that Turner is putting into the NHL is a whole lot more than what Turner Sports is paying for Dynamite. Uh, now, Tony Khan is saying that uh, they do have a two-year contract. But in the same interview, he sort of uh, opened up the possibility that if it was good for all involved, he would be open to moving, which might be a nice way of saying is that, yeah, we have a contract, but they pay us a lot of money. We want to keep the contract. We'll do whatever they tell us to do, which is probably right. the way this will end up going down. Uh, there's no word yet on when Turner is going to air uh, hockey. They could be airing it on TBS and not care that they're running opposed uh, to AEW Dynamite on TNT. But there's also a very good chance, Doug, that they don't want their two of their uh, higher paid uh, live broadcasts to be running opposite each other on Turner Networks. So uh, mm -hmm. stay tuned to this one. Uh, it's been good for all involved, really, that uh, NXT and AEW no longer face each other on Wednesday nights. Everyone's ratings in general have gone up. Uh, but there isn't another night that AEW could move to that it would not be opposite uh, either Impact on a Thursday or WWE programming of any sort on any of the other days of the right. uh, work week. So stay tuned. Um, and other news regarding, well, I guess AEW related and WWE related, but uh, apparently we'll see if this goes anywhere. But uh, the Wrestling Observer is reporting that WWE is – not really that thrilled with being considered the one promotion that isn't willing to work and play well with others and being on the other side of that forbidden door. Um, but it is the Wrestling Observer that is reporting that WWE are in talks with Major League Wrestling, and it's along the lines of, of the old Evolve deal that WWE had, or some are saying even perhaps the deal that WWE had behind the scenes with ECW in the 1990s, where they actually supported them financially. The idea supposedly is to let some of the developmental guys that WWE has locked up to contracts that literally do not have a chance to get on TV to go work somewhere else uh, in order to get some exposure in front of an audience and in front of a TV audience. In the case of MLW, uh, the, the deal that uh, WWE had with Evolve back in the day was they would allow some of their NXT talent to go wrestle on Evolve shows. And, you know, in the case of MLW, unlike with Evolve, MLW not only has national clearance, uh, MLW, as of this past week, has started on Vice uh, cable broadcasting. And, Court Bauer, who is the owner and operator of MLW, has uh, in a recent interview even indicated that they may, when they return to, to uh, producing shows in July, may actually go live on uh, Vice TV and have a live weekly broadcast. 
whether or not WWE uh, ends up uh, in a partnership with MLW, it, it seems strange that this is what's being reported, but Dave Meltzer is one of the more prominent wrestling reporters out there. So there may be something to it. Again, we'll see if this goes anywhere. And I'm more inclined to believe this one when I see it. It seems strange that uh, the big dog would want to work with anyone, much less uh, a, an independent promotion. But stranger things have happened, Doug. Considering how WWE has historically not even acknowledged any other um you know, it's like they're the only wrestling in the world and don't even acknowledge any other, you know, federations or, or, or operations. I, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, did, I did think it was interesting, too, that they made a point in the Observer to compare it perhaps to the deal they had with ECW. Because to your point, uh, the acknowledgement, WWE mm -hmm. never really acknowledged that they were uh, working with ECW. They did have a bit of a crossover uh, briefly with the, the King going down the ECW arena. But as far as the relationship of them actually supporting them right. uh, financially, none of that was known. So uh, obviously it will be a great position for MLW to find itself in. They just uh, keep tripping all over themselves with good news. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they've been the little indie that could that, you know, I've championed on this show a lot. And then suddenly yeah. now they're on, uh, cable, uh, you know, have a weekly cable show starting and perhaps even more coming with WWE. So stay tuned. Uh, and less positive wrestling news, uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling has canceled three shows uh, scheduled for later this month in Tokyo due to new emergency orders because of a spike in their coronavirus cases in the city of Tokyo. This is just something for all of us in the wrestling uh, fandom world to be, to best be wary of that as the American wrestling promotions began to reopen to paying customers, which they all say they're going to start doing in the second half here of 2021. So within the next month or two, you'll be seeing American wrestling shows open up to the paying customer. Just because you have your ticket, don't think that necessarily your show is going to happen because this sort of thing could happen just about anywhere, depending on what the, the local uh, situation is there on the ground. So uh, definitely something to be mindful of because Japan has in general done a much better job than we have. Uh, in New Japan has been open to fans for the good part of the last six, seven months. And yet still in one of their largest cities, you're going to see shows being canceled this month because they suddenly have a, a, a spike of a variant could happen here also. Um, and it, you know, it's, we're still in a global pandemic. <laughs> so this, this ain't over yet, folks. And it, yes, indeed. It could be buyer beware just that, uh, you know, hold on to that ticket. You may need it for a later date, a postponed date, a refund. Uh, it's, uh, it's slowly coming back, but you're right, Doug, we're not out of the woods. Um, it has come to light that former NXT head referee, uh, Drake Wirtz had been quietly suspended earlier this year. Uh, speaking of coronavirus and not out of things, uh, he, it, old, old Drake has become uh, rather notorious for sharing his extreme views online. And this includes uh, following the Proud Boys and other such uh, activities there on social media. But this latest controversy occurred this past week when he called into the Seminole County Board of County Commissioners meeting and claimed uh, that, quote, Forcing and normalizing face coverings only makes it easier for sex traffickers to target kids. Yep. So that, that happened. Did. That, that, <laughs> did, that did happen. I saw a little it's, bit of the video because uh, he, you know, of course, he didn't just call it. It wasn't an audio call. It was a, you know, like FaceTiming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see what, if any, consequences there are uh, that may come from this as far as his, his employment. Many behind the scenes in WWE have expressed amazement that he's still employed at this point. And that's how it came to light that he had already been suspended earlier this year for a completely opposite, uh, you know, a, a different infraction, I should say. Um, there have been obviously consequences uh, to some of his actions such as the uh, the aforementioned uh, suspension, um, but he also has lost his head referee position in NXT, which is something that you know he used to hold. He used to have also a behind the scene role, and that had been stripped of him uh, over again many of his other actions. Yet for some reason, he's not found himself unemployed at a time when WWE has very carefree let folks go left and right, uh, talent referees. 
uh, announcers. But uh, we'll see if there's any consequence to to this one, uh, considering that WWE's stance, especially as they're getting ready to go back touring, is to follow local regulations, get vaccinated, wear a max mask kind of thing, and then they have a you know someone representing their company calling in making these kind of remarks. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. I mean. Clearly, he's passionate about what he was talking about, but he, apparently he was doing it on company time in his NXT referee shirt. Or what, so. Not a good look for a publicly traded corporation. Oh, well. Kevin, does that wrap up the news? Got two more things for you here, and it is about about factions. <laughs> hold your horses. We're going to get there. All right, hold, hold four of your horses. Ah, ah, a tease. Yes. Uh, Impact Rebellion, unsurprisingly, was one of the best performing pay per views in company history. It happened last Sunday night. It's been extremely well reviewed, also. In addition to seeing the Kenny Omega uh, match where he and Rich Swan unified the AEW and Impact Championships, uh, which, by the way, if you haven't heard, uh, Kenny Omega won that, that contest. But it also included the debut of the former Big Cass and his return to uh, professional wrestling. But W. Morrissey, as he's now being known, is the new name of the big man making his return to the sport. And then finally, more title versus title news. Uh, that forbidden door continues to swing in every which direction except towards WWE. Uh, this weekend, Impact <laughs> Women's Champ Deanna Perrazzo was involved in an angle where she has now challenged uh, AAA's Women Champ Apache for a winner-take-all match at Triple Mania, which is the WrestleMania of Mexican wrestling. Uh, but Triple Mania is going to feature this title unification contest between Impact Women's Champion Deanna Perrazzo and Apache, who is the women's title holder in AAA. This uh, Triple Mania event will also be worth catching because it will also feature Impact, AEW, and uh, AAA Mega Champion Kenny Omega putting the AAA version of that trifecta on the line against Andrade returning to the world of professional wrestling. So this has got uh, a lot of interest for American wrestling fans who may not otherwise uh, be that familiar with AAA. No date yet on when Triple Mania will be occurring. And that, Doug, is the opening bell. All right. Let's get to the main event, Kevin. Let's talk factions. Factions. Factions, factions, factions stables, factions. Not everywhere you look. Though. <laughs> they well, are everywhere. <laughs> They are from the four horsemen of yesteryear to the inner circle of the day. We are going to talk everything factions because they are back in a big way. We're going to look at why that might be and why not all companies are maybe looking at, at this trend the same way. And Doug, I have some questions for you and we're going to right. stay tuned folks. You ask your questions as well, but I got questions. I've not ran past Doug because we're going to put him on the spot and I'm going to do it right out of the gate, Doug. All right. Out of the gate, I think before we have a conversation about factions, we need to define what a faction is. So I'm asking you, the fabulous Freebirds, a tag team or a faction? Faction, because there were more than two of them. By my de by my definition, you know, you cannot be you are if there are two of you, you are a tag team. You know, if there are three of you, you are a faction. <laughs> You are a stable of faction. Well, I think we're going to use that interchangeably tonight because when I looked into it, I can't really tell that anybody has any idea what the difference is and, and the two words you <laughs> use interchangeably. So, but yes, three words, absolutely a faction. You know, the funny thing is I set this question up to just, to, you know, to get on the table as how many men does it take or women does it take to make a faction different from a tag team? When I was a kid, I probably thought the first faction I saw was the Four Horsemen. Yes. But then when I started to think about this show, I thought to myself, you know, I, I I would say now, knowing what I know about factions, I would consider the fabulous Freebirds and the Freebird rule of you never knew which two you were facing. Right. Uh, I think that that is totally a faction. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're on board. Uh, three men, three women, that's a faction. Two, 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 men. two men, a, a bodyguard and a manager and you got a faction like when you got more than the two people standing out there i'm a, i'm with you that's a stable all the way because yeah, i was i was thinking about this you know team extreme you know jeff matt and lita faction you know yeah yeah 
And I might not have thought about that at the time, but looking back over the history of stables and factions, that's definitely the, the definition. That's the definition to me between I never was big on six man uh, tag team matches or six man tag team championships with th which different promotions have tried throughout time. This, the idea of three people wrestling together all the time just doesn't have the same appeal to me as tag teams. But the idea of you got two guys here in a ring and you got the muscle standing behind them and you got the guy in the microphone and the kid behind the scenes that's on his way up training with like all sure. of that. I've always loved. I just think that that is, is something that has, is unique to the world of professional wrestling and instantly draws me in. Um, and Doug, why do you think that factions work so well? Why is it, why is, why is it uh, something that we are attracted to as wrestling fans? When you see a really good faction, what draws you in? So I was thinking about this. Was, there was a documentary back in the heyday, like a, in the nineties when professional wrestling was just huge. And, you know, there was a lot, uh, I think there was like a uh, anthropologist talking about the allure of the NWO and, and to a lesser degree, you know, degeneration X at the time, but you know, you have, you have this almost tribal belonging then, you know, even though it's, it's encapsulated in TV, you know, there's this tribal belonging, but they're flashing their signs, whether it be the clicks too sweet later picked up by the bullet club or, <laughs> you know, the NWO for life. You know, we have all those, you, know, you have those signs, yeah. you know, it's like a gang, or it's like a tribe that you, you can be a part of. You know, you, you can be part of a fandom of, like, say, the Tribal Chief. You can be a fan of the Tribal Chief, Roman Reigns. But, you know, you can include yourself in a faction. You know, there's going to be somebody there for everybody to relate to if your faction is built correctly. Because, like you said, you know, you've got your 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 veteran, you know, uh, you've got your your muscle, you've got the guys coming up, you've got the new, you know, it. They're just depending on how it's built. If it's built properly, there's something there for everybody, and I think that's part of the appeal. Definitely, I think that uh, having multiple personalities uh, it allows a, more of a, a flavor. To, to infiltrate an entire group that has a common purpose. Like they're usually these factions are united behind a common goal or purpose. The idea of there being strength in numbers um, that, you know, you're better together than alone from a company standpoint. Sometimes factions are formed because uh, it helps get guys over. You can take guys who aren't over, put them in a faction with guys who are over and it raises everybody. Um, you can hide the weaknesses of some guys. Maybe you have a guy who's a really great wrestler, not a great talker. You know, Michael Hayes was not the workhorse of the, uh, the fabulous Freebirds. He was the showman. He was yeah. the flamboyant one. He was, you know, Terry Gordy was the 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 big guy, the muscle. Uh, but he, Roberts was, you know, more the technician. Michael Hayes was the flash. He was the microphone uh, talker. He was, you know, so you can hide a little bit of some guys' weaknesses by putting them with folks who have the, the elements that they don't, and you put them together, and sometimes you end up with magic. Um, Doug, what do you think is an ideal faction? Like, if you were going to, you know, delineate out the roles. What does a good faction have? Good faction has, you know, and, and this, you break it down. You have your, your, your singles wrestler, usually probably the best talker too. You, you know, you've got your singles guy, you've got a tag team in there, and then you've got your a fourth, a fourth member. Oh, look what I did there. <laughs> <Up and coming. laughs> you've got your fourth guy in there to up and you know, I think, you know, once you pass, Four and maybe it's just a little bit of bias on me. You, you, maybe it become. It, maybe this is where you go from stable into faction, because maybe once you cross a, a numbers threshold, because there are a lot of groups right now, especially within AEW and New Japan, where there are more than you know. They're almost like like um, MMA camps. You know, you know, you have these groups, but you know the to get back around to your question because <laughs> i will scroll hard on uh, while talking about factions and stables you know you got your talker you've got your you've got to have a tag team and you've got to have the up-and-comer you know you, you know that that is the perfect faction right there 
do you like the uh, the factions that throw in like uh, the muscle or those that throw in a manager on top of everything else or, or in some cases manager, I'll say slash mentor because, you know, obviously the four horsemen had JJ, even mm -hmm. though they didn't need another talker in that group, they still had JJ. And it would seem that there's a homage, especially at AEW right now, where mm -hmm. you have a Tully Blanchard or an yeah. Arn Anderson serving in that mint or a Taz. I mean, my gosh, they're yeah. full of uh, mentors who are or managers really. Uh, in all but name only. Um, and even though this group, these groups have guys that can do their own talking, I still, there's something cool to me about seeing the old dude there as well. The grizzled old guy who doesn't get in the ring anymore, but mm -hmm. just there to show that, I don't know, continuation, I guess, so to speak. Yes. You know, I was thinking, you know, exclusively in ring, but, you know, absolutely. I, you know, you can't, you know, mention the four horsemen without talking about JJ and, you know, the pinnacle, you know, we have Tully, an OG member of the four horsemen, <laughs> you know, in the, in the pinnacle driving that, you know, and they've been telegraphing that group for goodness. What? Since the AEW's inception. <laughs> so what do you, I mean, AEW's inception, you know, right from the start, AEW had the inner circle at the outset they sold themselves in many ways to Turner Broadcasting on the idea of we're bringing in, you know, these guys from Japan who everyone knows and loves the diehard wrestling geeks will throw in a few names that the American fans know. Uh, but I mean, the, the big names Americans know aside, like your Chris Jericho's when you think the bucks uh, hangman uh, Cody, these were all guys that were involved in the Bullet Club or, uh, you know, in the case of, of Cody, I mean, with his dad, old school Booker in the days of of the Four Horsemen. Uh, why do you think that, why do you think we're seeing th them back? Why a resurgence after 20 some years of their, you know, not, maybe there's been a heel uh, or a stable or two here or there, but there's never been multiple stables since the 80s and 90s uh, days of professional wrestling. It was like a 20-year like blip of time where you might have one running wild, but suddenly they're everywhere. Why do you think that they made the return in such a big, big way? So I'm going to say in North American wrestling anyway, I think it all has to do with the promoter. I mean, I don't think, you know, Vince McMahon, clearly, Vince McMahon isn't even a fan of tag teams, you know, clearly. So adding more people to that, I mean, you know, we had a great faction with the Hurt Business, you know, that, you know, was disbanded for clearly no reason <laughs> on a whim. So, you know, even, even the New Day, which, you know, Free bird rules there. New day, you know, a faction. You know, they were they lasted longer than much. But you know, then you look you, you look down south to what Tony Khan is doing. I think Tony Khan is just a fan like us, you know, especially like me. This is why me and Tony get along so well. Because <laughs> you know that you just can't really beat a great stable war, you know. And I, I think he is a fan of that, and I think it's it's really driven by that. And honestly, as far as AEW goes, AEW was founded by a faction, really. Exactly, and I think you actually hit on it for me when you said that not in North America. Like, yes, this has never gone away in Japan, and the Bullet Club and the Elite, and you know the Bucks and Kenny, all the guys that are the foundation of what became AEW they had all recently worked in Japan and were in that culture. They draw on that experience. So it, it makes a lot of sense that the creative forces on the wrestling side behind AEW either all come from factions or in the case of Cody comes from a, you know, a wrestling family where it's the old school style of getting heat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and maybe that's, maybe that informs a lot of what AEW is doing now with much larger factions. Cause you know, we're seeing like, you know, five, six member groups, you know, I think the smallest factions may be like the best friends. Well, you know, they're even a four person group now that they've added, you know, the alien <laughs> when now that they've added Statlander. So we're looking at what Jurassic Express probably is one of the smaller factions, if not the smallest yeah. faction. <laughs> yeah, the, you're right. This aren't these aren't three, four uh, men, women team. They're uh, you, again throwing the the mentors and advisors, and you, they're they're small gangs. They're stables. Maybe that is. Maybe you're right. Maybe that is the difference between factions and stables. Is the, 
some arbitrary number, but if you have a ton of them, then then maybe you are looking more at a stable and not just the four guys that yeah, are standing. I mean, maybe maybe, maybe in a stable you have you have the uh, archetypical roles of you know your, your talker, your tag team, your enforcer, you know, and then when you clearly go beyond those those archetype archetypes for you know the wrestling community where you have multiple enforcers multiple you know young guys coming up that you know maybe that does it but i mean really if you look at AEW, it doesn't really go closer to mimicking a lot of what you see in new japan where with chaos and suzuki goon and you know bullet club you know <laughs> oh yeah you're absolutely right japanese wrestling has long lived uh, bread and butter on uh, these multi-person matches, these uh, multi-stable wars between the different factions. And you're seeing a lot more of that in American wrestling because we're now more in a global wrestling landscape too. So fans are more accustomed to that style as well. Uh, you see it in Mexico also. There's uh, a lot of dojos and uh, you know that are producing uh, complete stables of, of folks that are under a single trainer and they take on the, yeah. you know, the, yeah, the, faction, as if you will, of those mm -hmm. folks. But you know, right now, if you look around modern American wrestling, uh, Impact has like Violent by Design and Decay and ROH still has Villain Enterprises and The Kingdom and Los Angeles and more. Uh, MLW has Contra <laughs> Unit. <laughs> 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 I was going to mention them just because I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to mention with MLW another one I have trouble with, which is Promotion, Promociones Dorado. Oh, I got it. Promotion is Dorado. See, factions are teaching me things. But, you know, we're talking like much smaller, especially with ROH, MLW, and Impact. Like, this is not your AEW. This, they're smaller places that I can name multiple factions. And I think we were, you know, we hit on it a little bit earlier, but, you know, WWE did just break up the Hurt business. Uh, they broke up uh, uh, the New Day, which I'm glad you mentioned them as a, as a, a faction. They just broke up Undisputed Era. Um, mm -hmm. can you name another faction? I'm trying to think. Is there a, f a faction right now functioning in WWE or all of these factions we're talking about external from WWE right now? Well, they also just broke up, thankfully, the anarchist retribution. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> so, that one wasn't working out, but you're right. That's the that was, that was broken up, but um lucha house party you know they they broke that up but i think yeah. that had to, had more to do with uh folks not just being happy with that and saying okay we'll break you break them up and make my tag team then and, and you know you you hit the road but i mean i don't think they're thinking of nobody i mean that's nobody. strange um I, I know you mentioned it earlier. I was going to ask, I had it in my notes to ask you the question, why you think it is that WWE doesn't have the same love of factions, um, but I, you you nailed it. But historically, It's the man at the yeah. top. Historically, WWE, prior to being the worldwide phenomenon it is, was a territory. It just was the biggest territory of the Northeast, the New York market that everybody wanted. It was known as a big man territory. You couldn't be a small wrestler. You couldn't be a tag team. They wanted if Vince saw Vince Senior, I guess, as would have started this belief. Uh, and it's in many ways carried on down through through his son and, and through the globalization of WWE. But the idea being that if I have two guys, then I put them together. Uh, that you know, if I can make money by having one of them uh, go this way and one of them go that way, then now I have two stars instead of just one star, which is the way they'd see the tag team. So the Northeast, even way back to the territory days, was always considered a big man territory for singles wrestlers. And really outside of a few blips in time, uh, you know, the Attitude Era, they did they give you the Hardys and the, and, and the Dudleys. And, and I mean, even tag teams, uh, mm -hmm. that was just a small period of time where there was multiple tag teams at the same time. It is long been hard to get Vince to get behind two guys being together, much less when you say three, four, five, six guys together, not interested. Um, Unless you involve him in it, then he's all on board. <laughs> corporation. Yeah. 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 Exactly. The corporation. Do you see that changing? Do you think that that is, or do you think the fact that, I mean, I, I, I think that the biggest story in WWE uh, in, in recent weeks is everyone's general belief that you had a good thing going with the Hurt Business and you just broke them up arbitrarily for no real valid reason to the benefit of no one. 
Imperium. Um, wait, Imperium's still a group, right? There's more than two in Imperium. Yeah. Yes. They're they're not broken up yet, right? Okay, but they do they count since they're in NXT? <laughs> Bring them to the main roster where they'll they'll get broken up. I was gonna say they're 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 even NXT adjacent as their home base is NXT UK. I'm guessing Vince doesn't watch the product there. If he finds out, <laughs> they'll probably <laughs> break, break it up. Get, get this big guy up to up to the main roster yeah. now. <laughs> and I think that is a, a lot of what there is to do with that because, um, in truth. A lot of factions are ways to hide uh, the weaknesses of some other guys that are, or, or put guys who maybe aren't doing a whole lot on the card, give them new purpose. And a lot of times, Doug, it is to shine a light on that single source of like, here's the guy who's going to be the breakout that we want to be the star. But right mm -hmm. now he needs a supporting cast of characters. And it's a great way of going about doing it. I don't understand that, you know, in the in the case of like a hurt business where you're trying to make Bobby Lashley, uh, you know, go from the Lana fiasco and everything else he'd had bad happen to him since he'd been in the WWE and suddenly trying to get him hot for a main event at WrestleMania. They put him with a, a, a veteran like MVP, mm -hmm. a great talker. Uh, they put a couple of guys who were doing nothing, uh, Cedric Alexander and uh, Shelton Benjamin, uh, one veteran, one up and comer, both of whom have apparently nothing that creative has for them. And suddenly it all clicked. Classic, mm -hmm. uh, classic faction style, as we've been discussing, all the elements were there. Why did they break it up so, so abruptly, so prematurely? Yeah, I, I, I really wonder about that, unless it's, you know, that mindset of, okay, you know, Lashley's world champion, world champion doesn't need, you know, the, the, the stable behind him, you know, especially somebody like a big man like Lashley, but, you know, then you're like, you know, we, we are just an Uso returning away from, you know, the, the tribal chief having, you know, yep. his own stable there. So I, I, I'm not really sure about that. But you, you mentioned Click, and I want to bring something back around. Do behind-the-scenes stables count in this conversation? Hey, because we're talking about everything about stables because that is, yeah, there's a lot of stables that are real-world stables that have nothing to do with what we see on camera. Because we have, you know, of course, the Click, I think the most famous. And then I'm also thinking WWE-wise, you know, Undertaker's stable, what is that, like Bone Street Crew? Is that what they were called? I mean, he, ha he has it on on his on his chest or on his stomach, you know, the BSK. I think it's BSK. And I'm sure there are others, you know, as well. But well, I mean, right now you're talking about the guys the behind the scenes in AEW. They're on all different uh, sides of the line when you're on camera as far as sure. which faction they belong to. But... As you mentioned, the guys that founded the company are really a stable of guys yeah. <laughs> of, of real work. Well, they're not the golden elite, you know. But <laughs> now, Doug, we talked about you know WWE obviously uh, not on board with the trend that the rest of the world is seeing with the return of factions. Um, do you think that it is possible that you can go the opposite direction? I ask only. I, I'm only asking, don't you or Tony get upset with me? But the Young Bucks this past week recently had to defend AEW uh, online uh, from the complaint that they actually have too many factions. Doug, do you see AEW as, in your mind, having too many factions? And is there such a thing as too many factions? Man, listen, too many factions is just like too much cheese on a pizza. You know, <laughs> it's just not a thing that, that should exist or come out of anyone's mouth. I mean, <laughs> It's not a thing. Internet, go away. It's not a thing. I will, I'm ready to fight anybody who disagrees. I'm 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 inclined to fight you, Doug, because I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what the right number is, but I don't know that you could throw a rock and not hit a faction in AEW right now. So maybe there is such a thing as it starts to get a little maybe uh, complicated as to who belongs to whom uh, and and why. Um, which one makes me, uh, want to bring up a quick game to play with you. All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, Doug, I'm going to give you a faction name and you tell me if it has ever been a real faction in AEW or if I'm completely making it up. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's do it. 
All right. We'll see if there's too many factions in AEW or not. So, Doug, the Hardy family office. Okay, that's real. <laughs> Started you with an easy one. The new disciples. Did you say nudist? <laughs> I did not. Maybe they're behind the scenes. <laughs> but are the wait, new wait, disciples wait, are, are have the they ever been an AEW faction? So are the new disciples the um is this the Vicky Guerrero and uh, and Nyla Rose and the other dude? <laughs> No, make that one up. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I only ask because I don't watch the darks, but you know, I do watch being the elite. Vicky Guerrero, um, and Nyla Rose, and there's a guy that are uh, that have a gimmick where they're all like, you know, stealing people's stuff and, and selling it back to them, you know, to build their church. <laughs> and <laughs> so it could have been. <laughs> That one seemed made up, that, um, unless that is their actual name. How about, uh, Doug, the pretty picture? Oh, that's not real, is it? That's real. That one's actually an, a current AEW faction. That's uh, Peter, <laughs> Avalon, Peter, Peter Avalon, Cesar Bononi, Ryan oh, Nemeth, and J.D. Drake. Oh, okay. The, Ru oh. the Euro Warriors. Wow, are these people on dark? <laughs> That one's made up. Okay. <laughs> Strong hearts. That sounds like a Brandon Cutler, like D and D adventuring group. <laughs> so yes, that was a real AEW faction. Uh, Sema, uh, Lindemann, and T Hawk from the OWE promotion. If you remember when they had the you know the crossover with Oriental Wrestling uh, Entertainment. Oh, okay. okay. So I, I guess uh, I'm not sure we've proved our point, but uh, I think we proved the point that there are so many factions in AEW right now that you would be forgiven, uh, not just you, Doug, uh, who is a total AEW mark, but if you're a casual AEW viewer and you don't know whether or not any of those are real or not, and half of them were, um, it might go to show that maybe there, maybe there is such a thing as so many that they're hard to keep straight. Okay, hard to hard to keep straight, sure, but too too much, absolutely not. <laughs> Still getting up that cheese on his pizza. He doesn't care if he chokes on it. <laughs> it's fine. And Doug, I don't think that there's any uh, way that we can have this conversation about factions without without you know sort of the elephant in the room here with a lot of the factions we're naming um, with a few a few. Notable exceptions, like you mentioning the New Day. Why, in your mind, and I'll tell you why in mine, do you think that babyface factions don't work in general? You know, I've been wondering about this. Because yeah, I, I think you need baby, you need babyface factions because I remember back in the day when you know in the in the hot the the high times of you know, the Monday Night Roar, Wars, where you would have a baby face getting bludgeoned in the ring by a just a gang. And I remember you saying, okay, so wrestler X needs a buddy. He needs some buddies to come and do the run in. But that never happens. But because, you know, you're not going to get heat. Uh, you're not going to get that heat if somebody comes in and saves you all the time. And you're going to look a little weaker too. You know, and, and you know, you want to get your baby face over, especially if you're going pushing on to bigger, better things. I mean, you have baby face factions like, you know, the Jurassic Express and. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the word you used earlier, I like uh, the gang mentality. I think that is why, uh, in general, heel factions just work better. It is the gang mentality. Heels are, are better in packs, <laughs> uh, it protects the leader. It protects the mouthpiece. It aids in the numbers game. It aids in interference and all the things that, you know, bad guys do to get heat. Faces are, in general, cowboys. Uh, think of loner heroes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who don't want to rely on others. Think you know, a classic, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Don't trust anybody. I don't need a bunch of guys doing my work for, or my dirty work for me. I'll take you on myself. I think there's that John Wayne uh old school mentality that faces are lone wolves and heels are the cheating and numbers guys. And so they make better factions in general. 
So how long then does an inner circle of face faction last now that they've, you know, you know, done the switcheroo there, I wonder? Well, and that the switcheroo is the key word to that big question because, I mean, the four horsemen, yeah, they're classic hill faction, but they were cheered and spent some time as face. Um, same for DX. People love the NWO. I mean, you could just, you know, heel factions are cool. <laughs> so they tend to end up getting cheered and at some point will become a face faction. But when you remember them uh, at their best or what we like to think of as like classic whatever faction fill in the blank, it's usually in those heel personas and not at the end when we're all just cheering them because we all agree that they're just awesome and we all love them regardless right. of what they're doing or how they're behaving. If you had to name the best heel faction, or, I'm sorry, the best face faction uh in in wrestling history since they are so few and far between just straight up face faction not like going back and forth uh like we were just talking but just pure on face faction team extreme i would think you know super over yeah super over <laughs> in their heyday you know and uh, I, I, I would have to do team extreme I was going to maybe say uh, New Day because when you brought them up earlier and they really, uh, you know, have been long running. But, yeah, I'd say that you're probably right that Team Extreme might be uh, the ones that historically would take that cake because there's not very many contenders to that crown. Um, on the other hand, Doug, <laughs> maybe this is a good way to, 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 to wrap up our discussion because I'm going to give you mine. I didn't tell you in advance that I wanted to do this because I wanted to just – you to just fly with it off uh, by the seat of your pants, but the way I roll. <laughs> if I'd have told you, you'd have done it uh, seat of your pants anyway, right? <laughs> That's <is> true. <laughs> we can't talk factions. We can't wrap up a conversation about factions, Doug, without talking five best factions of all time. What are your top five factions in in wrestling history? <sighs> Top five, man. Yeah, I cheated because I, I, you know, well, I didn't cheat. I, I thought of mine. I didn't put myself on the spot to, to extemporaneously come up with it like I'm asking for you. So I'm going to go with, you know, I'm going to go with the new kids and we'll put um, with a new day in there. <laughs> um, a couple of these are going to be flare based because uh, evolution <laughs> yeah. And uh, DX. <laughs> hmm. I know who my number one is, and I'm sure you do too. But I got one more. <laughs> <laughs> I got one more faction to slot in here. Have I said yeah. Team Extreme yet? Because we're gonna get them in there you too. Haven't. No, you actually yeah, haven't. Team, team Extreme, and then you know, breaking out, you know, the four horsemen for the number one slot without a doubt. You know, OG four horsemen. I'm talking Flair, Tolly, and Ole and Arn. OG four horsemen. That's what I was going to ask, which uh, which four, right? Yeah. Um, so for me, and with this last one, uh, well, I guess, you know, I'll start with a, uh, the pick number five and we'll count up. Um, but I'm going to go a little outside the box. I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not sure that this would really be my overall uh, in my top five, I probably could think of factions that I, I think might maybe deserve this spot more. But just because representation is so important, it's something we haven't talked about. The fact that we've talked all male factions, women's factions aren't really a thing. I mean, they're not. I mean, Riot Squad kind of recently. Um, but when I started to think of this in terms of the history of wrestling, because women have historically only in this modern era, have they actually started to get their due and we haven't really seen a long uh, sustaining female faction except for the beautiful people. Oh yeah. The beautiful people, which uh, you know, you got velvet sky and Angelina love as the OG core members, but mm -hmm. also in that over time, you've had everyone from uh, Madison rain to, uh, you know, Mandy Leon right now in ROH because the beautiful people are still kicking. Uh, and when you think about the fact that, man, okay, with a few, you know, changes and, and, and switches in and out uh, over the years, Lacey Von Eric was in for a while. Uh, I mean, there's been multiple members, but in some form or another, 
that's a female faction that has spanned the last 15 to 20 years almost of, of pro wrestling, which is, I had not thought about that, but you are absolutely right. Cause you know, I'm thinking, you know, the closest I come to even naming one would, you know, lead a, with team extreme with the Hardys, you know, and, but yeah. And then riot squad, riot squad. I mean, you know, we had, what was it? Uh, the welcoming committee and PCV when, you know, the, the, the four horsewomen started coming up to the main roster, but those were we short. Need, we, need, we need some yeah. good female factions out there. I think that there's obviously more than enough women's talent right now that could justify such a thing. So if you're listening, I know Tony watches the show to make sure that he sends He's the checks. So, Tony, talent, so. <laughs> <laughs> we know that everybody's already in a faction, but put a couple of ladies right together. now. <laughs> Let him know. Uh, so yeah, five beautiful people. Uh, four for me, Bullet Club. I I think just for the influence that they've had on the entire global wrestling scene, uh, they have sort of sparked a modern day renaissance in wrestling, and it's all because of the faction, the Bullet Club. Uh, it's probably been since the days of of the classic factions of the '90s and '80s uh, since we've seen so much merchandise. Uh, around one single stable of wrestlers the entire world over, no matter which organization you're giving your money to. That's pretty impressive work. They get my number four. Three, DX, uh, classic DX. We're talking China uh, mm -hmm. era DX with, with uh, Sean uh, Waltman, uh, the, you know, uh, Road Dog. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole crew, classic DX. Yes, they were a rip and a reaction to the NWO, but still, they are one of the best to ever do it. Number two, the NWO. Uh, that era really had two of the best factions at the same time on the opposing networks. It's too bad that you didn't have a, a pinnacle inner circle, circle kind of situation where you could actually see classic NWO versus classic DX. That would have been fantastic. But we're not talking down watered, watered. Uh, we're not talking about the watered down version of the NWO when everyone was a member and there was all the offshoots, but the classic core members of the NWO was a beautiful thing to witness in the nineties. And then Doug, number one, could there be any other? There cannot. <laughs> they are the, they are the gold standard. They broke the mold. They are the faction that defies in some ways, the rules of factions that we've discussed because mm -hmm. we said that usually you got your guy, that's a good technician and you got yep. your guy that's good on the microphone. And then you got yep. your guy that's muscle and the, yeah. no, this guy, this team had, everyone could talk. Everyone yep. could work. Uh, and yep. they still threw a manager in for just, you know, giggles, I guess, because at that point it's just an abundance of riches. That is why they will forever be the goat. Agreed. Agreed. Often, often imitated, but never duplicated, even when they've had members in other factions to try and replicate it. <laughs> and even though they didn't make my top five, I'm glad you mentioned evolution because what is evolution, but uh, you know, the, you know, four, a, a attempt four. to redo the four horsemen with flair and it still was great. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, Doug, you're frozen again. Oh man. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Look at this face. Right. I, am, I am thinking about factions right there and just <laughs> loving the, the modern wrestling and what a great world we live in where there are so many factions and so much cheese on pizza. <laughs> and we just got through talking four horsemen. So if Doug looks really happy, uh, that's because he's just thinking of the greatness of Ric Flair and the four horsemen right there. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, you might not be able to cue the graphic, but uh, are you ready to hit the big finish, my friend? Let me see if I can cue. Okay, hey. can I, I can cue the graphic, but I can't move. <laughs> <laughs> you can change the words, just not your expression. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, Doug, I want to start with my botch of the week, and it's not your expression. I think that that's, uh, that's just too good to call a botch. Um <laughs> But for me, the botch of the week, AEW Dark Elevation. I know I've complained about Dark in the past as a wasted opportunity uh, for for AEW when they only have one show currently on national network television that you should use your YouTube show for nothing but enhancement and squash matches. Um, I wanted to give Dark Elevation a chance to differentiate uh -huh. itself. And unfortunately, it's just after, even after a month, it's just more of the same of what we actually need less of. So 
the show Dark Elevation has been as long as two and a half hours of squash matches, which is followed the next night by nearly two hours of more of the same. So between Monday and Tuesday nights, Dark and Dark Elevation can have four and a half hours of squashes. And that's just that much more wasted opportunity. Uh, I would love it with all the talent they have. I, I would see no reason why they couldn't have an NXT style situation where they could take some of their underutilized guys and just have them exclusive to a show. Um, yeah. It just doesn't quite do the same thing when you have them winning on Dark Elevation and then being the enhancement talent on Dynamite. Yeah, yeah, they, they could do much better with, with Dark. Absolutely. And we can also, you know, I'll just slide into my botch of the week. I don't know if this is a botch or an embarrassment or whatever you want to call this, but at this point, AEW, and this is where Tony starts starts cutting off my checks, but AEW needs to do so much better. And you've touched on this, especially coming out of such a hot pay-per-view, so much, so much better with their relationship with the impact. You know, I read earlier that Booker T was calling them out, calling Impact out and saying, you know, they are getting the royal end of the deal. It's just not working. You know, it, Rich Swan losing to Kenny Omega makes makes him as the AEW champion, or uh, no, whoa, not the AEW champion, but the Impact champion just look weak, and it just looked like a weaker weaker production altogether. Unless, of course, we're building to something much greater here and i do have a lot of faith in long-term booking but right now I, with AEW's long-term booking anyway but right now i mean they just need to do better with, with this relationship agreed 100 percent agree um doug do you have a do you have a performance of the week you know i will say the performance of the week you know my, yeah, i'm gonna wrap it up into a match of the week because daniel bryan has done great and you know i mean it, Coming out of WrestleMania, I mean, he just went over above and beyond putting Cesaro over, putting Reigns continually over, and did it again on a Friday night SmackDown where the match lasted like 16 hours or something ridiculous like that. And I loved it. It's the only thing from SmackDown I watched. I was specifically, you know, I caught some high. Uh-oh. Doug, we lost you on the audio, so... While we wait for Doug to get back, I'll give you my performance of the week, folks. Uh, but my performance of the week, um, sometimes less is more, and sometimes it's the subtle thing. So my performance of the week actually is going to come from this past week's NXT broadcast. But there is a, a love triangle, like not even a triangle, a romance storyline that they have brewing with Indy Hartwell and Dexter Loomis. Not sure I'm crazy about romance storylines in my world of professional wrestling. However, I will say it was hilarious to me when um, we had in this past week a in-ring microphone. This was not something that they were actually doing in a promo, but an in-ring microphone pick up Hartwell looking to Loomis and saying, shut up, you talk too much. Dexter Loomis is a creepy weird character who's yet to say a single word on television and just the straight face Indy Hartwell uh, saying to Loomis that shut up. He talks too much uh, was to me just funny. And so I'm giving that my performance of the week since Doug's on pause, I will say a secondary performance of the week coming from the same broadcast. The million dollar man showed up on NXT this week. If you're an old school wrestling fan, you got to love Ted DiBiase. I have been very much enjoying uh, Cameron Grimes and his poor man's version, I guess, if you would, the hillbilly version of the Million Dollar Man gimmick. And Grimes has been cracking me up by week after week calling out Ted DiBiase as, you know, uh, as someone who uh, who is haunting him from the past. And so to see actually uh, Ted come on camera and interact with Cameron Grimes also gave me a great thrill this week. So uh, finally, I will say my match of the week, by far, Kenny Omega versus Rich Swan at Retribution. Um, this was everything that we could want it to be outside of any at all uh, doubt as to who the winner was going to be. That is not the fault of the men in the ring. That is the fault of AEW's promotion of the match or lack thereof. 
pretty much giving away the fact that there was no chance in the world that Kenny was going to lose this thing. So match of the week was Kenny Omega versus Rich Swan, title versus title, early match of the year contender. Uh, watch it if you get a chance. Mara Ronaldo, he was the uh, he was the announcer for this, so it also kind of gave it a big fight feel. Uh, definitely worth your time. And I think Doug is just saying uh, that I am talking, but he can't hear me. And uh, I cannot hear him, so I'm going to say, Doug, wrap it up. We're done. We are done, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Next week, we're going to be here talking WrestleMania Payback. It is a review, a preview next week, Sunday at 8. Thanks for watching.